Oh, yeah. It is the light time. The time of the light shining in the night. Lift up your heads. It's almost time to raise the dead. Hallelujah. It's going to be awesome, my friends. This thing is not even nearly over. Amen. You know, before I do anything else today, uh, well, let's see here. Let's see how we want to do this. Yeah, let's just go on and jump in the message. I started to do something different, but I'm just going to stick with the plan here. Amen, unless the Lord changes it. Now, I want you to go over to St. John chapter 1. Let's jump right into this because I want you to see some things today that maybe you've never seen quite like this before. People say, well, Brother Robin, you were just having too good a time today. Yes, I know it. Just let me be on it. And uh, it's always a good time when you can play and sing freedom and, and enjoy the presence of the Lord. It's a good time. Amen. Now, I want you to see this, that in the beginning, St. John 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's something, isn't it? The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, the word, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Or it means it couldn't hold it down and seize on it. Now, we in the body of Christ, we've approached a time, I'm not sure that, uh, that many saw coming. We have approached the parallel of this chapter in our time. Uh, we ooh and ah over political parallels, and we should. But when it comes to parallels of the glory, we should give it the same reverence. Now, what am I talking about? Well, we ooh and all over political parallels, you know, like uh, Ahab and Jezebel, Bill and Hillary Clinton was almost exact parallels, almost exact duplicates of time. And, and because the Bible declares what has been will be again, and God requires that which is past. And he's speaking of seed, time, and harvest, seed, plant, and harvest. And so you saw that uh, in Ahab and Jezebel's day, uh, the killing of the unborn and the killing or, or that we say the newborn in those days was offered to Moloch, offered to Baal. And uh, so that proliferated high. And in the days of Bill and Hillary Clinton, it did the same. In the days of Ahab and Jezebel, he had the crown, she had the power. So it was in the days of, of Bill and Hillary. He had the title, but she held the power. Everyone knew it. In those days, uh, there was, uh, you know, uh, there was a, a huge land scandal over a vineyard and someone came up murdered. Well, in their day, there was a huge land scandal and they vacationed at Martha's Vineyard and there was a death involved somewhere in this land scandal. And it's just like a parallel time and it just hits all the high points. And we look at that and the time of Jehu, we could go on and on. And we ooh and ah over those political uh, times, and we should because it lets us know exactly where we are. But now when we start to see parallels of the glory, then we need to ooh and ah over that too because it's something God is trying to get us prepared for. Prophecies in the political have gone forth, and they will come to pass. There's prophecies that will happen unless people change their minds will act actually take place. So now what we have to do is people say, well, change their minds. Yes, yes. Remember Isaiah went to Hezekiah and said, get your house in order, for thus saith the Lord, thou shalt surely die. He said, it's a sure thing. You're dead. You're going to die. He turns around, Isaiah does, the prophet, and walks out across the garden, leaving the palace and so forth. And by the time it takes him to get out there, the king has turned his face to the wall, and he starts repenting. 
And he says, Lord, don't remember what I've done wrong. Remember my righteousness. Remember what I've done right. And out there in the garden, the prophet Isaiah, who just said, thou shalt surely die. He turns around. The Lord said, go back and tell him now that he has 15 more years. Now, that was done. What if that hadn't have been recorded? What if none of that had have been recorded? that you hadn't have known the Lord spoke to him in the garden? What if that had all been in private? What if you hadn't have known Hezekiah repented, but yet all you had record of was that Isaiah said you will surely die, and then he lived 15 years? Everybody would have started saying, Isaiah missed it, Isaiah missed it, Isaiah missed it. But the Lord let you know that all prophecy about someone and what they're doing is contingent a lot of times on what they choose next. And so you have to remember that when you're operating in prophecy and the prophetic, and especially in a prophet's mantle. And people try to judge prophets that don't even understand the office. Now, let me say this. Now, well, I want to look at this parallel in St. John chapter 1. Now, watch what happens in this chapter. There are three things I want to look at first, the word, the war, and the prophet. There's the word, the war, and the prophet. Now, the word, in the beginning was the word, the word made it all. The word is final authority. That's why you hear me say all prophecy is subject to the word. All prophetic word, I've, I've always said that. All prophecy is subject to this book. All the gifts of the Spirit are subject to this book because it made it all. The Word made it all. So now what you're looking at is the final authority, which is the Word. Now notice this. It said in verse 5, And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not or couldn't hold it down and seize on it. That's the war. That was a war taking place. That was a war in the spirit that the darkness had arrayed itself that when the light came into the earth, it was going to grab it and hold it down and not let it shine. So there's the war. But then I want you to see this. He comes down here in verse 6 and says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now there is the prophet. So you have the word, the war, and the prophet. Now, you, you don't need to forget that. And then you come on down here, and you see the purpose. The purpose is, verse 7, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. So that is the purpose of that prophet to bear witness of the light. And Jesus is who he's talking about, of course. But now watch this. Then you have the purpose of, the, of it, and that you and I might become, verse 12, the sons of God. Now think about that, even to them that believe on his name. Then look at verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So you have the word, the war, the prophet, and the glory. And this is the order it's going to come in. The word, final authority. The war, darkness actually has a plan to hold down that light before it can get here. Once it starts into the earth, it's going to try to grab that light and seize on it and hold it down. Then you have the prophet. What was the prophet's purpose? Here, it was to bear witness of the light. He said to bear witness of the light, to start preparing the way for the glory to come, to start speaking the truth, saying, make the, the crooked path straight. Make it right. Get it right because the king is coming. Get it right. The light is shining. Here were the prophet's ministry. Here the prophet's ministry. 
is to point their finger and say, that's not true. I'm bearing witness to the truth. Whether that truth be an election or whether that truth be anything else that's trying to organize itself to hold the light down. Because God has a promise to Moses, as I live, he said, I, my glory will fill this earth. So you have the word, it's got to be final authority. You have the war, and you have the prophet. Then watch what happens. In order to stop the glory, because after the time of, after the prophet starts speaking, then you have the glory is about to show up. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody's hearing this, but you have these three things, and then you know the time of the glory is at hand when the prophets start talking. You know that it's at hand. And what is the prophet's message? Get it right. This is wrong. I don't care if you're a king or a pauper. That's wrong. Get it right. And all of a sudden, people hate to hear the truth because they have no more cloak for their sin. So here's what happens. Now, you got to see this. Watch. So the enemy immediately sets out to stop the voice of the prophet because he said, after me, he comes. It's laid out in order. After the prophets, it comes. Somebody's hearing it, I'm sure. After the prophets, it comes. He said in verse 15, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received in grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Verse 19, mark this down. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? Immediately, immediately, religion raises its head to attack the prophet. Immediately. He raises his head to attack the prophet. The first challenge to stop the glory was religion. And he came to the prophet, challenging the prophet. Challenged the prophet. Who challenged him? People who did not understand the prophet and did not see nor know the time they were in. The prophet began to declare, and what? What he was, who he was, and to get ready for what's coming. So the prophet began to, to, to declare, and then the people started listening to the prophet. And then the prophet said, consecrate, consecrate yourself. And that's what baptism is, is a sign of consecration, that you are giving everything, and you're giving everything you are to God. That's why when Jesus came, he wasn't baptized for sin. He was baptized to show his sign of consecration before his father to be the last Adam, to put it all back right again. And so the prophet was challenged by religion, but he kept saying, make his path straight. Get it ready. Get it ready. Get it ready. And then after this, Jesus went into the wilderness to hear his father speak. Now you have to see all of this. You have to understand the time we're in. The word, the first place, final authority, because it made it all. The war organized to hold down the light. The first challenge, religion. The prophet was to bear witness and point him out and point out the plan, to point out the plan. He said, behold, the Lamb of God. And then he told the plan. The prophet told the plan. Who taketh away the sin of the world. So the time we're in right now is preparing us for the glory that's about to invade the earth. 
It's about to come. But now it don't come without opposition. You need to remember that. It's going to come with opposition. Because the enemy, it's the word, the war, the prophets, and the glory. And the enemy starts his attack to hold the light down and seize on it. And the attack began with John the Baptist. Now, I want you to see this, that in Luke chapter 2, let's go over there in verse 51 and 52. I'm trying to do some prophetic teaching today that will help us because of the parallel times we're in. The glory is about to come. You know, I saw a major, major, and, and uh, it's actually a friend of mine. Now they're saying this was a headline on a major uh, news network. The glory invades the primetime network. Yeah, and they're, and they're going. <laughs> that was an announcement made this week. Yeah, and it's going to have a program in this primetime spot to talk about the glory and talk about supernatural things. So the supernatural, I think it said, is invading. So see, it's, it's getting ready for the glory to appear, to show up. Now Luke 2, verse 51 and 52, I want to show you something here, and I want you to really, really take hold with me about this. This is, this is, not, uh, this is about all of us. It's, going, it's coming back to all of us. Just this is what it's about. God wants everybody participating. Now, Luke 2, verse 51 and 52, listen to what it says. And he went, with, he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them, but his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Next verse. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Now, this is very important because what had happened was is they had went to Jerusalem. You know the story. And he's about 12 years old or he's 12 years old. He goes into the temple and they leave with the crowd thinking he's in the crowd. And then they realize three days later he's not there. So they turn and go back. And which is prophetic, three days and nights, they find him in the temple. After three days and nights, he will be found inside the temples. So they come back and they find him. And the first witness he gives to them is, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? So at 12 years old, he brings a witness into the temple that we must be about our father's business. Is anybody with me? So he brings this witness into the temple after three days and nights. This is prophetic of his resurrection after that. Now we have a witness in us when we make him Lord that we should be about the Father's business. But now I want you to watch what he did. He, after he told them that, it says he went with them and he was subject to them. That's in verse 51. Now look at that again, verse 51. Look at it now real close. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. In other words, he made himself subject to them because now he knows God is his father. And see, he didn't just come into this world with the poof ministry, you know, poof, there it is, poof, there it is. He couldn't come into the earth even though he is God in the flesh. He couldn't come operating as God outside the Abrahamic covenant because Adam gave it away and legally was the only way he could take it back. And he had to take it back through that covenant. So he laid aside those robes of knowing everything and he had to learn and he did it with the word. And by 12, he had a revelation that God was his father. That's amazing, isn't it? And he was teaching the teachers and hearing them teach, gaining revelation from what they were teaching. And now watch, but he's weighing it out in light of the, the absolute goodness of God because he knows his father is only good. So now 
he says after that, he goes and makes himself subject to them. And then it says this, says, and he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. This means he had to start growing in revelation, more revelation, more revelation. So when he comes to be baptized of John, now he comes to the prophet. And the prophet's going to baptize him. But the prophet says, I'm not going to baptize you. said, I need you to baptize me. Why? Because John was baptizing for the remission of sin. Jesus didn't have any. So he says, I need you to baptize me. John was saying, I have the sin, not you. And Jesus said, Suffer it to be so now. Permit me to be baptized now, John, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness or unto all righteousness. In other words, what he's saying is, is that I am not being baptized for the remission of sin. I am going to be baptized as a sign of my consecration before my Father, before heaven and earth, that I'm going to do whatever it takes to put this back right again, whatever Adam did to lose it. And when he gave that consecrated uh, action <coughs> of baptism, he came up out of the water, and the heavens opened, and in the Greek it talks about it was all the way through the netherworld to the throne of God. And God and him looked at each other. And he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Well, he already knew God was his father at 12. This was, he's the last Adam. He's going to put it back right. Now watch what happened after that. Said, then the Holy Ghost descended on him bodily like a dove. In other words, there's going to be an outpouring, an outpouring of the Spirit. So it's the Word, the war, the prophets, an out, a consecration and an outpouring. And once this outpouring starts, Jesus went up into the wilderness, and what this means is, is that the wilderness in Hebrew means to speak. He went into the wilderness to hear his father speak, and he began to fast and pray to get the full revelation of who, of what it meant to be the last Adam. And he did, 40 days, 40 nights. And I want you to notice this. At the end of the fast, Satan came to him and said, if you're the son of God, challenging him on that revelation he got at the Jordan. If you're the son of God, because the devil can't challenge you above your revelation. He, he, he can't tempt you above your revelation. And so he says, if you're the son of God, let me see you do something that only a son of God could do. In other words, I've only seen one other. That was Adam. Let's see if you can do what he could do. Command the stones to be made bread. The Bible said it was a temptation. So that means it was possible for him to do that. But he said this, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So now he has victory over the elements. He has victory over the elements. Now watch this. He has a revelation that he's over that. Then you have this, after this, he came down off that mountain. Now, you know how it went. He, he dealt with the, the bread. He said, no, only I, every word that comes out of the mouth of God. In other words, I only do what I see my father do. I only say what I hear my father say. He didn't say that, so I'm not doing it. So he has victory over all of this. Then the scripture says that one of the gospels say he was with the wild beast, the animal kingdom. Then it says the angels came and ministered to him. Well, when the angels came and ministered to him, then it was the angelic kingdom. You just think about all of that. 
This is the kingdom Satan was talking about when he said, see all these kingdoms? They were given to me. I'll give them to you if you'll bow down and worship me. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan. So that was man's kingdom. So he, he, he offered him all kinds of things. He offered him, uh, you know, the kingdom of man, kingdom of angels, kingdom of animals, the elements, the, the dirt kingdom, everything. Well, he wouldn't take it. But now watch this. He comes down off that mountain, and the Scripture says he returned in the power of the Spirit. So now he's, he's operating completely out of his spirit in these revelations he has received. And he will not move from them. He always lived by faith, perfect in every way. But after the outpouring, now he has been time, he has, he knows full revelation of what he's doing. So he comes down off that mountain. And he comes down, the first thing he does is he goes to a, uh, he starts saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, the office of a prophet. Then from that point, he goes to do his first miracle and the wedding at Cana. They don't have any wine. They ran out of wine. And so he says, fill these big water pots with water. Now, remember, Satan tried to get him to speak to a rock and make it a piece of bread. And he wouldn't do it because his father didn't tell him to. Satan was trying to be his father. If he had have obeyed him, he would have had rule over him. But he beat him. He said, you get behind me. You don't even belong up here where I am. He said, I only live by what I hear my father say. So he gets to the wedding at Cana, fills the water pots, says, draw out now. Suddenly now he's dealing with the elements again. Draw them out. Draw out of it. Take it to the governor of the feast. And it was the best wine they had ever tasted. So now he's, he's watch now, you've got to watch this close. He meets no opposition at those water pots but his own mind. His own mind. The water's not challenging him. He's meeting his own mind. And so he, he turns the water to wine. Then after that, he grows again, and he speaks to winds and waves. Once that is achieved, the next thing, his, his consciousness grows again, and he walks across the water. All three to do with water and all an ascension over the other. Then he moves into after that. Now, what is that? He has met no mind but his own with the water. No mind but his own. He knows who he is. He's dealing with his own. But then once that is done, he starts his healing ministry. Look how he does it. He heals Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. Then he heals rotting flesh on a leper. Then he spits on the ground and makes eyeballs. Rubbed it in the man's eyes and created his eyes. Now, suddenly, one is an ascension over another. And now he's walking in this realm where miracles are every day, every day, every day. Seems like every day somebody comes up. You can heal me if you will. I will be clean. Would you, what would you have me do for you? I need to be able to see. You believe I can do this? Yes. And he heals them. He, he heals people of maimed, withered, uh, whatever, the, whatever it was. Now he's walking in that completely. And then there's the dead. He moves over into the ultimate power of fear, which is the fear of death. And he walks on over into that realm, and when he gets over there, you find Jairus' daughter dead a few minutes. Then you find the widow at Nain, her son dead a few hours. Then you find Lazarus dead four days. And so now, He's operating and conquering death. Death is just being conquered, conquered, conquered everywhere he goes. Remember John the Baptist sent word, are you the one? Should we look for another? He said, 
The poor have the gospel preached to them. He said, the, the sick are healed and the dead are raised. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. He's conquering it all. And then he asked his men, who, who do you say I am? You're the, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, Peter said. Jesus said, flesh and blood hadn't revealed that to you, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed it to you. And then he starts talking to him about how he's going to enter into death because now revelation of the elements over his dealing with his own mind, then all kind, manner of sickness and disease, all manner of death, and now he's got resurrection on his mind. He knows he had that revelation moving in him at the tomb of Lazarus. He said, I am the resurrection. And then he entered death himself. And after three days and nights, he had paid the price. And God called down into that pit of the damned and raised him from the dead. And he came out and defeated death, hell, and the grave. The resurrection himself. The glory. When he turned the water to wine, the scripture said he manifested his glory. Think of that. Then he told uh, Lazarus' sisters that if you believe, you'll see the glory, and then raised him from the dead. So think about this a minute. This is where the church is. The church has to come to the place where it meets its own mind. The church itself. The glory's about to show up. It's showing up in pockets all over the world, but it's about to fill the earth. There's going to be an outpouring like no other outpouring, and th there's got to be. And you hear Christians say this. I've heard them say this. Well, I want to know why we can't just go to Walmart and just start pulling people up out of wheelchairs. How come we can't just, just reach over and get them by the hand, pull them up out of the wheelchair? How come I just can't lay my hands on terminal cancer and see it healed just like that? It don't work just that way. It works when you meet your own mind and know who you are in him. That's what he's waiting on, is us to grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. To where you meet your own mind. You've got to start meeting your own mind. Knowing who you are in Christ Jesus. You want to walk in the power he walked in. Do the greater works that he did. The first thing he did was face his own mind. He consecrated to God. He fasted and prayed. But then he met his own mind with these elements. The church has to begin to meet its own mind first. Once you have done that, there's nothing else there. But some people can't even believe for a pair of socks. And a pair of socks is don't have a mind. That's your mind. You're, you're facing your own faith at that point. You have to begin to meet your own mind before you go and start trying to meet the minds of others. I don't know. I don't know if this is exciting to you or not, but I, I, I'm, I'm trying to make a point here that when he met the water, the water didn't have a mind to really resist. I remember one time Austin came in and there was a, a, a chicken. He had a chicken. Was it, was it that time or was it before you got there? One of the chickens, it was two incidences, and it had died. And you brought it in, and I was going to pray for it. Yeah, and it was paralyzed, and suddenly, boom. Yeah, the chicken fell out. But I'm going to tell you, in the spirit, but you had prayed for one, I think, before that. Maybe you can stop me if I'm wrong. And somebody said, well, how did that happen? You said it didn't have a ch any choice. Or was that me? One of us said it didn't have any choice. It was a chicken. Yeah, it don't have a choice. It don't, you didn't, you're not meeting the chicken's resistance in his mind. See, the church has to meet its own mind first. Start believing God for a pen. Believe God. Uh, speak 
to what you, you're believing for. Speak the word of faith. There's no mind to resist you but you. Once you know who you are in Christ Jesus. I remember Brother Hagin used to say, go through the New Testament, every in him, in whom, in, in Christ, underline it and say, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. You must settle it in your thinking before you try to meet the mind of someone in a wheelchair. Yeah, but if God just poured out the power, wouldn't they just jump up? You have no idea. I remember watching a man of God one time on a platform, and the people came up there, and they were deaf. And, and they said, he looked at the deaf person and said, what do you want? And the deaf person didn't come for ears. They came for their feet. Something was wrong in their feet. You don't know where people's minds are. Remember, Jesus asked the man at the pool of Bethesda, do you want to get well? He was dealing with his mind. Once you deal with yours and it settles who you are, then you can walk out here and start dealing with the with the sickness of illness and creative miracles, all dealing with others' minds. Then after that, you'll see the dead start being raised. We've seen all this in pockets, but not on a daily basis like Jesus did. Not just the body walking through the earth manifesting glory. And so after that, you start dealing with, with until death becomes a commonplace thing of raising the dead. Could you imagine that? Authority over elements. And you just, it's just like tornadoes have no, ch no choice, no chance. They're just like Jesus. Peace, be still. And the calm scared everybody more than the storm. Then he starts walking around healing the sick. People with the missing limbs would grow back on their, on their body. Rotting flesh like leprosy instantly healed. No, somebody was born blind, he just creates the eyes. And so they start following him everywhere. Now you know how he fed the multitude. Elements. And then you start meeting, doing the works he did and the greater works than that he did. Just what he said. Then after that, you grow to another place where we start, as the body of Christ, we start dealing with death on every hand, dealing with death, dealing that raising the dead, whatever it may be. You know what happens when you start getting to that place? A revelation. You start longing for resurrection. You start longing for the resurrection because you're seeing it manifest. You're seeing the glory, and it won't be long after that the church will call for the return of the king. And when it reaches that cry, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. You think about that. And so we have to start today. Spend enough time in the Word to know who you are in Him. Be meet your mind before you try to meet others' minds. And so when you lay your hands on somebody and you don't see them get well, just do it by faith if your mind can't meet that yet. People, people sometimes, I think, I'm talking about people in the body. They're always quick to blame God for why something didn't happen. They want to blame him right away because God's not performing according to their revelation. He's not performing. What I mean by that is he's not performing according to the religion they were taught. I mean, God's got to do it this way, don't he? Because the Baptist church told me he did. This can't happen today, can it? Because they said it couldn't. The Methodist church said this. 
The Presbyterians said this, and the Pentecostals said it had to be this way. So it can't be happening that way because it's not happening according to my denomination. Well, you have to remember something. It's a sequence of things. Number one, the time we're in is the Word. First place, foremost, nothing. This book is subject to nothing. Everything is subject to it. All prophecy, everything. Remember that. Then the next thing is you've got to know that we're in a war. This glory is about to come. It's already being set up all over the, all over the earth. And when it does, the first thing that happens is the darkness says, I will seize on this light. I will hold it down. I'll keep it from coming. But over here, the prophets are yelling, this is coming. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. And religion raises its head and said, silence. And they come and say, who are you? What are you doing? John finally answered, you brood of vipers. He wanted to stop what was coming. Whether they knew they were doing it or not, the enemy knew what he was using to stop the glory. Hallelujah. But it didn't stop it. John kept talking, and he kept talking, and he kept talking. And then the day Jesus came walking down the Jordan, walking down that bank, he said, there's the Lamb of God who takes away. He even gave the plan, the sin of the world. He was talking about Abraham's sacrifice. There he is. Think about that. Jesus is baptized and there's an outpouring. The consecration came and there's an outpouring. Well, the body of Christ has got to get to the place of the outpouring so that the glory can be manifested. Well, God's just going to do it whether we like it or not, ain't he, Brother Robin? Well, he didn't save you whether you liked it or not. There could be an outpouring of glory and you never be part of it. You never even know what happened. How is that? Why do we talk about spiritual things and we can't even understand uh, uh, natural things? Here's the natural. There can be a room full of people and everybody has a cell phone. And all of a sudden a signal comes through that room and don't ring anybody's phone but one. And there could be a hundred people there, but only one of them. It rang the same thing you could be a part there could be glory being poured out everywhere and if your receiver is not there you never know what happened I remember one time a long time ago and I've seen the glory show up so many times and I remember uh, it's almost like an earmark of this ministry everywhere we go and start speaking and when the word starts coming forth the glory starts showing up in the room. And I remember one time I was outside and it was so, I looked up and said, look at all that smoke around those lights. And someone, they, people were staring. Wow, look at that. Look at that out, outside. And somebody else walked up, a believer. And they said, look at that. He said, oh, you mean that fog? That, that fog? He wasn't talking about glory. He thought it was natural fog. He immediately dampened the belief of everybody standing there. You know, here is the thing. Woe to those who damper the belief of those God has, has spoken to. Woe to those who would crush their belief in front of them. Teach them not to believe. Try to conform them into your corral of horses. They can only run according to you. Woe to that. That's not true. That's not so. Jesus didn't act like Pharisees. He didn't look like Pharisees. He didn't walk like a Pharisee. 
And he sure did things that he, he, this is what he told them. He said, you came and you looked at John the Baptist. He said, what did you come out to see? A reed shaken in the wind. He said, well, what did you come out to see? A man in soft raiment. He said, those in soft raiment lives in king's palaces. He said, but what did you come out to see? A prophet? He said, yea, and more than a prophet. For among women, there's never been one born greater than him. Now, this was in the Old Testament prophet. That's who he was. And then he told them later, he said, you didn't, you didn't like him because you said he had a demon because of the way he acted out there, and he didn't eat or drink. He said, the Son of Man came in eating and drinking, and you said, look at him. He's a glutton and a drunk. In other words, Jesus said, you ain't got any support for us whether we go or stay. So we might as well just do the works of the Father regardless. So this is the time of the glory. It's about to come in. It's already showing up in pockets. I can see when supernatural programs are put on primetime television. That's a doorman in the house of God opening the door for what's about to flood in. So we have to follow this pattern, the pattern of the word. Meet your own mind. Then you'll be ready. Fill it with the word. Final authority. There's a war trying to hold it down. Then you'll be ready to meet the minds of others and see them healed. Then after that, you'll start seeing death conquered everywhere. And when the body begins to move in this, we're going to get resurrection on our mind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I know that was probably heavy, and that's probably, well, Brother Robin, you know, probably scattered around some. That's scattered around some. No, I'm still talking about the same thing. It's the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.